Professor Kitten Primo, welcome to the Interacting Mind Center. Pleasure. You. Um, you have dedicated your academic life to study uh, how humans coordinate. Uh, why is that so important to study? Um, well, there's two reasons. One is scientific interest, and um, that's adequate in itself, but uh, I'm kind of utopian. I, I got hopes that uh, if we can understand how people inter interact, how societies work, then we can learn to make the societies, make our societies better in ways that will survive. You know, utopians usually have impractical plans. But I would like to be a utopian with a practical plan. Uh, and and one, of the, one of the specific things that you study is uh, fairness. Mm. Uh, and, and fairness is something that most people think, well, that is something for moral philosophers. Um, but you're an economist, mm. so to many, economics and morality seems like almost contradictions in terms. So what do an economic perspective has to, what does it offer with regards to uh, the study of uh, fairness? Well, I'm not a very orthodox economist. Um, and, uh, and even if I were, I don't think there would be any serious contradiction because the idea that people have that economists uh, assume that um, people are irredeemably selfish is just mistaken. I mean, perhaps once in the past economists thought like this, but that's been dead for a long time. So people, um, economists do indeed assume that individuals will maximize their own utility, but nothing says that they have to have selfish utility functions. They, uh, uh, St. Francis of Assisi, um, and be an agent in one of our situations, and uh, why will he want to maximize his utility? Because he's got utility for the welfare of other people. So there isn't, I don't think that's an issue. As for moral philosophers, why shouldn't we leave these issues to moral philosophers? It's because moral philosophers, by and large, are hopelessly impractical. I mean, they, they invent um, castles in the air. If you try to implement their utopias, they just fall to pieces immediately. And um, so I think um, that uh, unlike orthodox moral philosophers, I think that fairness is a tool, a social tool washed up on the beach by the forces of evolution. And it's not, it didn't evolve to work in big societies like we live in now. It worked, it evolved to uh, work in small societies of hunter-gatherers. A, a, a hundred would be a large group in such a context. Um, but I think what we should try to do is, number one, find out uh, how it works on that scale. And it still works um, in small-scale things. In the, in the little coordination games of which human interaction largely consists. You know, who moves how much when two people uh, encounter each other in a narrow alley? Who gets that parking space? Whose turn is it to speak next? Those kind of things. And we solve them so effortlessly, effortlessly, that we don't even notice that they're coordination games. We don't even notice that they could be solved otherwise. And um, and this is what gives me confidence that fairness is still working and working very smoothly and efficiently in certain situations. Now, what I want us to do, not just me, but you two and, and your, and your um, institution, I, I would like us to try and understand um, what fairness is like, what its structure is like, how it's influenced by cultural and conte contextual uh, factors. And if we can understand how it works on the small scale, then we can hope to apply it on the large scale. And uh, utopian, I know, but there it is. <laughs> but what is so? If if uh, fairness is something that evolved through processes of natural selection, then it must have an, a function. It has a function. So what is the function? The function is also, I think, you know, other people disagree, but my my view is that. Um, well, as everybody's view is that 
uh, all game theories, real life games always have very large numbers of equilibria. Only equilibria, Nash equilibria, are available as uh, ways to operate because only equilibria can be stable. That's why we call them equilibria. So if we're going to have, a st if we're going to find a stable outcome in whatever our current game of life is, it's got to be in equilibrium. But the problem is which equilibrium? And evolution faced exactly the same problem when it was making um, our pre-human ancestors into humans. And um, a major problem, perhaps some people argue the major problem, was how do we cooperate? You know, how do we divide up what there is to be divided, not just the pluses but the minuses, not just the benefits but the costs? How do we divide them up in a way without conflict? How does a group cooperate? And uh, I think um, evolution um, solved this equilibrium selection problem. And the way that it's solved, we call that fairness. And the moral philosophers think you know, the rules of fairness are written in some kind of um, platonic um, metaphysical world. Uh, but people like me think, basically, we think it's all nonsense. This is the way things evolved. If they had evolved differently, we would call something else fair, and there would be metaphysical philosophers telling, telling us that whatever that alternative was exists in some platonic world. But if, um, if fairness is, as you're saying, a product of, of evolution, wouldn't that suggest that people sort of intuitively agree on what is fair and what is not fair. When, when I sort of look out in the world, I see all kinds of disagreement yeah. and debates about, so is this fair or is it not fair? How, how do we reconcile okay. these two notions? There's two things to be said to this. One of them is, I, you notice I do not maintain that fairness is currently operating everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. I just maintain it operates in small scale situations the kind of situations that hunter-gatherers might have faced or would have faced in uh, ancestral times certainly does not work um, on the large scale. And in fact, in those cases in which moral philosophers just lo love to discuss, um, you probably know the, the trolley, uh, the story of the trolley everybody knows. And nobody knows what the answer is. Everybody disagrees. Um, it's in precisely those situations that fairness isn't working. Otherwise, we wouldn't need to discuss it. We wouldn't even think it was a, an issue. Right? And um, uh, so that's, that's one answer. Okay. It doesn't work. The other point is that I think fairness, according to my theory, my very controversial theory, I think that uh, fairness has two components. One, it has... Um, let me take a step back. I think it's like language. So Chomsky, um, Chomsky discovered. I'm still contested, but I, I'm pretty. I'm pretty safe with Chomsky. Chomsky argues um, that uh, language has two components. You know, one, a universal deep structure, which is the same for everybody, um, and two, a cultural component. So. Um, Stephen Pinker has this um, wonderful book called The Language Instinct. And there he, he puts it on the table, uh, deep structure is genetic. Um, if we didn't have a deep structure, babies wouldn't be able to learn language. All they would hear is a babble of noise, which they, their minds would be able to make no sense of. Uh, but the particular language a baby learns depends on the culture in which it is uh, brought up. And, not only the culture, but the context. You know, all teenagers know how to talk teenage argot uh, with their friends and you know, to talk perfectly comprehensibly to adults. And uh, so it's, it's, it's the same with fairness. There's a common universal deep structure, but the, um, what varies between cultures is how people's welfare is compared. It's like in some societies, still, women are treated as inferior. Mm -hmm. So they count for less. And uh, in that society, in those societies, 
if you were to ask people, is it fair, that the, the, uh, for example, that the woman should get less to eat per body mass than a man, people would say, yes, this, this, is, this is how it's meant to be. But in our society, in Denmark, we, um, not just in Denmark, of course, we, we don't think that. Um, although in my youth, you know, I'm not so very old in my, my youth, it was, it was still common for people to think that way. And the women would agree. Yes. The women would agree. I mean, this, this is the point. Everybody agrees it's consensual. Uh, so this is a cultural thing. So one way to phrase it is that we have uh, an innate tendency to say that divisions should be equal, but yeah. then the conflict and the cultural differences emerges yeah. when it's equality. Of, yeah. It's of like um, David Hume said the same thing. Almost everything is already in David Hume, mm -hmm. if you look. Um, David Hume said... Um, Natural laws are artificial in the sense that um, they're culturally contrived. They're natural only in the sense that it's natural that we should have natural laws, as, as understood. Yeah. So I'm saying the same thing, but only in a different way. So I just have a, a final question here uh, for you, and uh, it, you have hinted at the, at the answer previously, but it's about sort of the current state of, uh, of knowledge that we have. Yeah. So in your opinion, what is the kind of key questions in search of answers uh, that we need to understand in order to, to know how and why and when minds uh, interact? Well, I, you know, I, I think the basic necessary framework is there already a game theory. Yeah? And um, where, where economists uh, keep pushing the wrong button is insisting to the way to think about this is through rationality. Mm. Uh, they, they try to develop the subject by assuming people are more and more rational. And this, is, this I think, is a blind alley. I mean, it's quite interesting from the point of view of mathematical philosophy, but if we care about people, we care about improving society, we have to turn to evolutionary game theory. And um, not just evolutionary game theory, but the kind of bounded rationality that psychologists study. So we need to do this more. You know, evolutionary game theory is really quite difficult. Um, we have to start looking at the dynamics of the way in which people in real life find their way to equilibria. We have to discover the ways of thinking that they find particularly hard. And uh, so we have to do theory. And then we have to do experiments. So it's really important to do experiments. And not just the bullshit experiences that Sorry if bullshit is a bad word. Um, not just kind of bullshit experiments to show off, but the kind of bread and butter experiments that uh, perhaps aren't very interesting. You're not going to make a big splash, but really matter. And you know, personally, I want to see people doing experiments on fairness. Uh, so trying to understand the structure of fairness even more through uh, evolutionary game theory, trying to apply yeah. it to the way that the people... Really See, I, th I, th I think what evolutionary game theory can do for us, because it's not that psychologists haven't studied in this past, in the past, because they have, and they continue, but in order to know what a new interesting experiment is, or um, why you know, something happens that you didn't expect, and then the question is, why did that happen? You go back to the theory, you say, oh, I, I, I neglected this, I neglected that. Let's put that back in. Does it explain? If it does explain, great. What is now predicted? This is the kind of thing. So it's kind of experimentation guided by theory and theory, refined you know, via experimentation. Well, Just are... like a physicist. Just like <laughs> physicists do. Yeah. There are many uh, important questions uh, ahead. Well, thank you very much for your time, Ken. Pleasure.